Welcome into another Warchant one on one. This is Ira Schofel, managing editor of Warchant.com. And I'm joined today by one of the busiest men in Tallahassee, one of the busiest men in, in college sports, uh, Michael Alford, who is the new CEO of Seminole Boosters. I say new CEO, but he's been on the job for almost a year now. But uh, in the oh, grand seven scheme, months, seven months are. <laughs> it's, close. it's on the plus side, plus side of a half right. year. We're rounding oh, it up. Oh. But uh, in the in the you'll probably be the, the new CEO of Seminole Boosters for a while, considering the guy you replaced, <laughs> Kenny right. Miller, was was in that position for uh, for many 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 moons. Uh, Forty five years. I figured after year twenty five is when you're not the <laughs> new CEO you, anymore. You won't be the new guy. <laughs> um, well, you were in the news last week. There's been a lot going on. We're going to recap uh, a lot of those seven months, some of the things you've done so far, and where Seminole Boosters and FSU athletics are going forward. But um, obviously one of the big stories of the last week, uh, tremendous response on our website. We had a lot of people talking about it was the, uh, proposal, the early preliminary proposal for possible renovations to Doe Campbell stadium. Uh, you made the presentation to the board of trustees kind of outlined the vision, the plan, um, and the process. So, uh, I was curious just kind of what the, how, how the response was. It sounded like the board of trustees were favorable to it. I'm sure you, you guys have heard uh, plenty from, uh, all sides over the last week or so. Uh, I was just kind of curious how, how you was, is the response what you expected? It, it is. And it's really what I expected. Um, it's been mostly positive uh, as, as we go through this process. Cause once again, I got reached out, a lot of people reached out to me go, and commented. I remember taking that survey that, that you discussed and we brought in CSL even before I, got here. So a uh, great job by our staff of really listening to what our fans wanted and what experiences they want at Doak Campbell Stadium. And when you, when I remember when I first came here and the first time I walked into Doak, I looked around and was like, okay, this, this, this has opportunity to, to do some very special things. And uh, that's what's really exciting is not only change, uh, but we're incorporating the feedback from our fans uh, when they did the market study and, um, and being able to look and we provided them different opportunities there to talk about ledge seating and load and gave them opportunities to say, what would you be interested in? Taking their feedback, working with CSL, who's the industry leader and then bringing in Populous, uh, who's sports architect leader and say, have, working with them to say, take this feedback and let's incorporate it uh, into the stadium you know, very preliminary renderings, but into the stadium to say, this is what the fans said they wanted. Here's what it is. And I'm looking forward to going out and just sitting down individually with each person and, and discussing. Uh, and that's really all right. I know you and I were talking offline the other day, and, and I was telling you that this is really step two of about 100. Uh, that's got to take place. And uh, But I have the experience of doing this either at other collegiate institutions or on the professional level. Uh, and as the process is very similar. You know, the one, one thing I was, when I was talking to somebody about this project and, and I was talking about the college sports experience, you know, I remember when I was a student, I'm sure it was the same when you were a student, you know, you would go to, nobody thought twice about going and sitting on a metal bleacher for four hours or, or being cramped and, and crunt, you know, it's just, but like everything, you know, things, times change and people change and, and the stadium experiences change. Um, the way I, I've kind of tried to look at it and I've uh, tell, talked to some friends is because there's so many challenges now to get people to games because the home viewing experience is so great and all the different things, it's almost like you don't want to give people a reason to not come to games. Correct. Is, is that kind of part of the mindset uh, when, you're, when you're approaching these things, just trying to create a better experience? 100%. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a, a story. So when I got reached out from the Jones family to come to Dallas, and uh, I was very happy in Tuscaloosa. We just done a renovation there. Football, we just hired Coach Saban, and football was about to take off. You could see that coming. But at the end of the day, when I went to Dallas and, and sat down with the Jones family, and Mr. Jones was diagramming literally on a piece of paper the uh, the video board that he was wow. talking about putting in. And it was, I, big, and it was a big. It was a big piece of paper. It was a big, a big piece of paper. <laughs> And uh, I looked at him and said, Mr. Jones, you know, explain to me your mindset behind this. He goes, Michael, my competition is not the Rangers, not the Mavericks, not the Stars, not my competition is the home theater. 
And we need to have this stadium have experiences where I get people to come and whether whatever happens on the field, the experience walking out of the stadium is going to be top notch. And that's just some of the thought process going behind this um, is let's look, let's from the time you park to your culinary experience, which we're in negotiations right now with the new concessionaire, to your social gathering spaces, to the different unique experiences that happens in a stadium on a game day that you, you have with your friends or your family. And when you walk out of the stadium and after that great victory, you, you've, you've had a fulfilling day <laughs> of everything. And we're still going to have something for everyone. Uh, our, as you mentioned, if you like sitting cramped, we'll, we'll still have that available for you. But also, you know, if you want a little different price point and you want to sit in a ledge seat or a freestanding porch seat, we're going to have that experience. We're really just trying to diversify our range of products to match the experiences that our fan base is experiencing elsewhere. And I brought this point up uh, the other day, you know, 70% of our fan base travels an hour over an hour and a half and 60% over three and a half hours away to Tallahassee on a game day. So that represents a lot of income to the, to Leon County uh, coming from out of market on set on weekends, football weekends. So we need to keep that income coming to Leon County and how we do that is have the experience match what they're coming here to do. And, um, you know, a lot of those people are coming from professional venues uh, in their markets. So they're used to the seven to 10 to 12 different unique experiences that you can choose from. And that's just something we're trying to add here on the collegiate side. One of the neat things I think uh, about the process is, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we see it in all walks of life, whether it's, you know, mm-hmm. our, where we go for restaurants or, where, where, you know, whatever people, a lot of times businesses change things, but don't really talk to us about it. You know, they just change it and you got to deal with it. And I know a lot of sports fans and a lot of FSU fans have dealt with that over the years uh, for different, with different changes. Um, but I, the fact that you, you kind of made a commitment to if, if people have existing season tickets and they're going to be affected by this process, you're, you, you guys are offering to sit down with them one-on-one and, and really talk about their options and, and uh, kind of a, an individual selling experience. Uh, how important is that going to be to this process? Well, it's very important to me uh, that, that we really sit down and walk through all the different options with every single person affected. And, and that's going to take time. Uh, when, I, when I say that, uh, somebody called me uh, immediately and I was like, I promise we're going to do this. Uh, now, am I going to do it next week? No. Uh, <laughs> we've got to get to step three, step four. But there is, there is a timeline. There's a process of when we're going to sit down. Over the next two years, or having gone through, it takes time, and sit down with everyone, walk them through what's available, uh, walk them through their options, so they can make an informed decision. But also more important than that, show them um, the finances. Uh, I am I am transparent, and we will sit down with them, say, "Here's what it is. Here's what the finan- Here's the financial support, where it's going, who it's going to support, and here's some comparables." to our peers across the country that we consider our peers and really be upfront and honest with our fan base on a one-on-one basis and say, Here, here's our vision and ask you to partner with us. Um, so I think it's the most fair way to do things. There is an orderly process, the way, the way we sit down with people. It won't just be a shotgun approach. Um, we will sit down one by one uh, according to our donor point system and say, okay, here's, here's your opportunities. Here's your opportunities. And that takes time, but it's the right way to do things. Um, instead of just sending out a mailer, the right way to do it is to have that personal approach. And if, and if this happens and, and, and there is interest and demand and, and you guys can make this happen, it also is going to create improvements to the actual structure itself. And, and yes, um, in terms of the, underneath maybe what, what, what we see of the stadium and, and things that I'm sure have been needed for a while? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, when you walked around and did our study, but then, then you bring in the architects and they're looking at the restroom conditions, the aging of some of the infrastructure issues we're having. That need, I mean, it needs to be addressed. It's a 70-year-old stadium and, and some of the infrastructure needs to be addressed in the, in the next few years. And uh, so some of this is for sure going to address those needs, address some ADA 
concerns that we have moving forward in the future. And all of that will tie in uh, to a whole, I wouldn't call it renovation of the whole stadium, but a renovation for the fan experience uh, moving forward. And some of it are, you won't even notice. There, there are right. some beams that needs to be replaced. And part of this goes to fix those infrastructure issues. Well, this is uh, kind of the newest thing on, on, on your agenda, but really one of the, uh, I think one of the ways most people, most FSU fans have really come to know you since you came on the job is, uh, you know, really trying to get out the word about your One Tribe campaign and, and yes. kind of a, a different approach to, try to bring up the numbers for Seminole boosters, uh, you know, not necessarily go out and push people to donate a hundred thousand dollars or $50,000, but, but reach out kind of a, kind of a grassroots approach. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how has that gone? I, we see the updates on social media. If people are on right. Twitter, you can follow the Seminole boosters account and see the updates on how many new members you guys have each week. It seems like the response has been really good. It's been great. People have really stepped up. Uh, and once we did, uh, gave them an explanation of where the annual fund goes to support. It goes to support the 500 plus student athletes that we have on campus. It allows us to provide those educational opportunities to them and, and leadership opportunities to help grow them during their time here at FSU, because that is our mission. Our mission is to support the educational mission uh, of the university, of, of what President Thrasher sets forth and what A.D. Colburn sets forth, and to support those student athletes. And that's really where the annual fund goes. It goes to support the operational needs of the athletic department. And when I first got here, as you've heard me say many times, I get, did an analysis and I saw it drop from 16,000 members to 9,400. That represented a $6 million gap that were annually, not, not in totality, annually, that we were not able to support those student athletes with, with scholarships and, and the like. Um, so that's really why we got to get that number back up because it allows us to support them. It allows us to give them opportunities so they graduate here with a meaningful degree on, in one hand and championship rings in the other. And they go on and contribute to, to the, their communities. And the one thing I, that one reason I got back in college athletics, I've said it many times is I wake every, up every morning with, with energy because I know I get an opportunity to change lives. And uh, when I woke up and I was in the pro ranks and I joke, but I wasn't making a difference in Jason Witten's life. Uh, and when I went out, but you know, you have that opportunity when, you see these young men and women go through here and you provide benefits to them, whether it's tutoring and everything that we're able to supply them to see them graduate. And so many of our kids are first generation college graduates in their families. So not only has that changed their life, but it changes the expectations of their children. Uh, now, it's, it's a generational change. And that's something that really motivates me every morning and motivates to go out and try to raise the funds to supply those opportunities. Because uh, I know the better, I know how these students benefit from these opportunities we're able to provide them. Uh, so it's really exciting. When you say that, I was immediately thinking back to uh, you know, Coach Hamilton. He, he's yeah. made that comment a lot of times. And one of the things that, you know, one of the things he's explained and his obviously he graduates players at an amazing rate. I don't know if anybody right. in the country does, does it does it better, but um, you know he said it's not just about that player getting his degree, but in a lot of cases that player is the only person in their family and maybe the only person in their neighborhood that's got a college degree, and uh, you know it can have a huge impact. Uh, yes, on more than just that person, even in the, in their family, um, and, and that's why the annual fund's so uh, important. We're at sixty four percent of our goal. Uh, so we're on pace. Uh, we're on pace to, to do well. And we just got to keep just going out and sharing the message. Of, uh, I, I bring up the gentleman I spoke to from Iowa all the time as one example. And I spoke to many, but he joined the annual fund for the first time because of uh, we, we relayed the message of where it's going to support. He goes, Michael, I'm never going to home season tickets. I live in Iowa. I watched the Knowles play religiously on Saturday. I follow, but I've never joined because it's always been tied to tickets. You gave me a different reason to join uh, now because I see where the, the funds are going and how it's going to support these student athletes, not only their athletic goals, but their academic goals as well. And, and that's what's rewarding uh, is getting that message out. And then, and, and sometimes there are certain donations for people that aren't as familiar 
certain donations can be earmarked to certain teams or things like that. But this this is more for just the annual fund yes, itself, sir. right? Yes, sir. Uh, just the general annual fund, uh, get our numbers up. I want to get it. We set a goal of 13,000. We're at about 8,300 right now. Uh, so we're over halfway there with 64%. So we're just just getting there. And, and the deadline's April 9th. Um, I, I know walking in, we had a big stack this morning of event. And that's one thing our, I've been stressing to our constituents. And I know our staff's been stretching is we got to we got to change deadlines uh, because April 9th is it goes into the process. And after April 9th, um, if you're not renewed, then, you know, your tickets will come up. It takes us about two or three weeks to get it all set up and make sure we have everything in the system. But then when we go to ticket selection time, if you're not renewed, you're, somebody can go select seats. It gives people an opportunity to upgrade. Wow. Um, or we could just kind of hold on and hold on. But now we're allowing people to actually look at the Bellina process. You'll be able to go online and upgrade your seats to, to better locations if, if you want. You also, you know, that there's the, the grassroots approach. And then there's also uh, the approach where you, you target bigger gifts. And I know that... Um, this this year, the seminal, uh, the spring tour for the second year in a row, you guys weren't able to hold the spring booster tour, right. which is always such a big event. Last year, it obviously couldn't happen because of the pandemic, and then again this year um, as well. And it's always been such a, you know, it's a chance for the football coach and some of the other coaches to go around the state, go around the southeast, even up into Atlanta, and uh, meet boosters and and kind of uh, have nice fundraising events. But you guys were able to go out and, and bring Coach Norvell to some limited gatherings, right? And was kind of curious how that went um, and, uh, you know, what the response has been when you've seen Coach Norvell speak to a group and, and kind of how how, he's res- how he and your guys' message has resonated. Yeah, the, the great thing, uh, and I bring this up, one of the first questions I got, and it wasn't a spring tour. I've heard, heard some people call it that, you know, I refer to it, and I go, hey, it's a little different. That's a different spring tour because we were very limited. And what we we couldn't have big gatherings, and we tried to follow CDC guidelines, and but still wanted to get uh, Coach Norvell out because he's so dynamic, and his message resonates with what we're trying to get accomplished. Not only in the boosters, but the university and the athletic department. I mean, it, and he's very energetic, and he wants to get out and share his vision, just like I want to get out and share the vision and ask people to partner with us. And uh, I can tell you that it resonated very well with our with our fan base that we were able to get out and see. And we kept it to 30 people and, and follow guidelines in small, intimate settings. But part of the message also was to to use it as, as you mentioned, a fundraising event to share our vision, uh, share his vision for where he's taking the program. And, and we need to be in lockstep, which we are. And the number one question I get all the time is when I've been out there talking to our to our fan base when I got here is about the communication hour and uh, it never fails. He's going to get asked about McKenzie Milton. I'm going to get asked about communication. Uh, and, uh, and I can tell you between president Thrasher, AD Colburn, myself, coach Norbert, all, all the coaches, uh, coach Hamilton, I was spending a lot of time with yesterday, you know, we're, we're on the same page of where we're wanting to take uh, not only the department, but match the educational mission of the university and, and what he's trying to do on the football side of things. And uh, it, it's really, it's part of the, some of the best communication and vision uh, alignment that I've been a part of. And I, I've been a part of some good ones. And uh, it's really something that's going to really build on for the future of, of our programs. Can't uh, let you go too long without talking about the, the football facility, which obviously is every, on everybody's mind, a big project that, uh, FSU has been working on for several years. Uh, it seems like it's getting closer and closer. Uh, do you have any kind of, uh, feels like it's, it's so close. You can touch it. Maybe, maybe, yes. um, when, when, when will people start hearing more about, uh, the kind of definite plans for that facility? Well, we're working on some final touches right now. Our, uh, you know, we got here and I, and I did a deep dive. I heard populous, as you know, to come in and kind of educate me. They did the first uh, study, and I want them to come in and use my experiences of working with them elsewhere, but also my experience of doing a few of these and look at various different sites, various different models. Because when, when we talk about doing something um, here at FSU or anywhere, but really here 
we want to build something that FSU deserves, the history, the tradition, and we want to do it the right way. And we want to build something that's going to last 20, 30 years and be, be trendsetting. Um, don't look to build something that, okay, we finished the, con the, the project and we're still behind our peers. Um, let's, let's go ahead and, and make something that people um, are pointing to a, as the industry standards. And um, so we've worked with Populous. We're, we're, we're finalizing some touches, uh, we're finalizing some location questions, um, and really excited about where it's heading. And fundraising is going very well. Um, we've eclipsed the 40 million mark in uh, gifts uh, for that facility, and, and we're continuing to go out. And that's really without going out and showing people what we're, what right. we're, where it is and what the final product is. Uh, but there should be some news coming on out of that real soon. And on that topic, just, you know, people talk about the arms race in college athletics, and, and, and I think that has a negative connotation sometimes. Yes. Um, but there is – there are practical uh, reasons for these types of facilities, right? I mean, it's not just about – people hear about the slide at Clemson or, or the right. different things at different places, but there's a practical reason a facility like this is needed, right? No, that 100%. And I'm not, that every time I talk, I go, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Uh, the, the, I'm just saying it's a necessity. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. If, if you want to be the, the best and compete with your peers. Um, and it, it, it's not quite the arms race in the fact that we're not going to be doing anything in this facility that does not develop the student athlete. Um, you're not going to see any gimmicks in this facility. It's not my style. It's not Coach Norvell style. It's not A.D. Colburn style. Um, everything we're putting in this facility is about the development, the holistic view of the student, whether that's academic space and, and how is that designed to benefit them, whether that's nutrition and how do we bring the nutrition to the 21st century of what other programs and really what, what we're looking to do is get above them and bring it in people who do this for a living for NFL and NBA franchises. And, and how do we get an advantage there in the scientific side of the nutrition that we're able to provide our student athletes? Um, how do we look at what we're able to do uh, in the weight room and, and how, what can we do to develop the life skills program in this facility? Uh, so you won't see any gimmicks in the football facility at all. It's, everything's going to be geared about the student and how do we improve them. Uh, but also by, by moving football out of more, let's say. And um, what that does, it allows us to free up space uh, within that facility that is going to allow us to almost triple our size for our academic space of all the 550 student athletes. That's much needed. And it's going to allow us to free up the weight room down below that right now is 20 programs and it, that uh, so times are very limited. You got programs having to lift at 5 a.m. in the morning just because of the time schedule between right. classes. And it's the only weight room we have available. So it frees up uh, the weight room space for other sports. And so they have more preferred times around their class schedule and practice schedule that they can get in there. It frees up um, the rehab ab ability. Um, for our student athletes so they can get into the training room and rehab their sport, rehab their injuries and get back on the field a little faster because of the time slots once again. So um, it is going to benefit football, but it's also going to benefit the entire athletic department and, and every program will be affected by this transition. Now I've got a couple more questions and I'll let you go. Yes. What, so you've been at uh, a bunch of different programs, as you mentioned, you've worked in the NFL at different organizations obviously uh, worked at Alabama, worked at Oklahoma and, and other schools. You came here uh, previously with the athletic, athletic director at uh, Central Michigan University. What what have been some of the – do you get to a point when you've been in this business where a co college campuses are, are kind of, you know, similar or or, or, or more different? And, and what, what kind of things have you learned about Florida State? Because I know you really hadn't been here much um, before you took this job. What have been some of the things that have kind of just been different about different compared to your other experiences? Well, I bring this up all the time uh, and it's true. Uh, and I say this, uh, this is not just uh, tongue in cheek talk. It is the, the people have really stood out to me. Uh, they really care about FSU, the love they have for this institution and in this industry, you've always heard about the great people of Florida state, the, the great people associated with the program, the great people, 
uh, throughout the state. And as I've traveled around the state and got to sit down and, and listen to not only their vision for where FSU, is, where they want to take FSU and, and mirror how I shape my vision for it based on those conversations, it, it's really great people who care about Florida State and they want us to succeed and they're willing to put not only uh, their resources behind our, our success, but their time. And, they, and that's something that, that really stands out to me since I've been here. And, and you're right, a lot of schools are, are very similar. Uh, when, you, when you go and you first sit down and evaluate where you've been in the past and try to put your vision and, and your skill set to say, okay, what can we tweak to get better? And really it's about carrying the torch. Our, I mean, Andy did such a great job here. Um, I just want to take the torch that he was carrying and, and carry it a little further and, and try to keep improving like they were improving uh, before I arrived, but use my skill set and my, my different vision to, to, to mold um, uh, that into success. But it's really taking the feedback I've gotten from our constituents and our fans and our coaching staffs uh, to what they want their programs to be. And then let's put a plan together. Uh, to achieve those goals. It's one thing to have a vision, but it's another one to have the processes and the plans and the goals, little mini steps to get there to have success. And, that, and that's really what we've been working on right now. And then the last thing, as I mentioned, some of the schools you've worked at, you've obviously been around some amazing coaches, yes. uh, different coaches, in different sports, but particularly focused on football right now. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at Coach Norvell, you've been out to some practices and Coach Norvell and his staff, uh, what has impressed you so far about them? I, I know you were familiar with Coach Norvell before you came here, but um, what has impressed you about what they're doing and, and kind of gets you excited about maybe the future of FSU football? You know, I've been fortunate, Ira, right, to, to work with, to hire, work alongside, uh, plan alongside some great coaches, whether that's Coach Carroll to Coach Saban to Coach Stoops, Jill McElwain. I know that's a – uh, a naughty word here at FSU, <laughs> but, you know, he's a dear friend and we were together at Alabama and I hired him at Central and I just went back and actually was able, we built a, a facility up there uh, that I hadn't seen. Uh, I left before it was totally completed. It was still um, none of the graphics and, you know, the flooring went down. And so I went back to watch my daughter and visit with her uh, a couple weekends ago and was able to walk through the facility with Coach Mack for the first time. And it's amazing. He goes, Michael, this is better than what we had at my previous institution at <laughs> the other school across the state. Right. Uh, and it's really set the tone for that conference. And once again, trying to do things that are trend setting. Um, but when you see Coach Norvell, what he really reminds me of, one, he's so organized. And it's kind of a, a, a mixture of a lot of different coaches that I've been fortunate to work with. Uh, very organized, very timely, very energetic. And um, so when I see that what he's doing on the accountability side of things about raising great young men, because all those coaches uh, that I've mentioned, I've been fortunate to work with, their core values are pretty much the same. Uh, and, but Coach Novell really reminds me of how he cares for the student athlete and the energy he brings to a practice. He reminds me of a young Pete Carroll. Uh, uh, being around Coach Carroll and just seeing how he conducted a practice, how it was very organized, very timely, um, but yet the energy level was at an all-time high uh, every time. You, you're going to go out, you're going to be short, but you're going to get the most out of every moment that you can get out of uh, was his philosophy. And, and uh, that's who he reminds me of, especially when he's out speaking. Um, to our constituents, and he reminds me of a young Pete Carroll, but he also has the qualities of all those other great coaches mm -hmm. and uh, the core values of really caring about the student and that, you know, he, he cares about them progressing on the football field and as they're, but more importantly, he cares about them as, as building great men, and he'll talk about that, and it's so true that he, he wants them to be great fathers, and get and graduate here with a meaningful degree and go out and contribute to their communities. And that's, that's the most important thing to him is that he's preparing them for life. And uh, when you hear him talk and everything he does is about shaping the holistic view of that young man and preparing them for the future is, is what some has really impressed me. 
Great. Well, I appreciate it. It's going to be a big week uh, for Florida State. A lot of athletics going on on campus with the spring game uh, as well on Saturday. It sounds like it's going to be a good crowd for that. Oh, we got so much going on this weekend. I got it because we got so much going on. I have it in front of me. We have softball against Duke on Friday night. Uh, we got the homecoming, we got beach volleyball Friday, women's tennis against Miami on Friday. On Saturday, uh, we got the scrimmage, of course, beach volleyball against Stetson, softball against Duke again. I mean, there's so much going on this weekend uh, with all the different events that I'm really excited about it uh, to be able to um, – witness the spring game here, even though it's at a reduced capacity, but just to get people back to Tallahassee. And, and I can tell you that the, the numbers for the spring game are doing great. We got 40 suites being utilized. The excitement of the people coming for the spring game to see uh, the, what the product he's and all the work that's going in on the field. Because one thing I always point out our, when I'm speaking to someone is people don't realize uh, Coach Norville and his staff didn't have any spring practice last year. Yeah. They weren't able to install their system. They were literally installing spring practice in, in their system, facing live ammunition in the fall uh, during games. And somebody brought up about the, the big jump we made against, uh, I think it was Duke. Duke we had like 10 Duke. weeks off and how well we played. And, and I said, well, I went out to those practices and they didn't know who their component opponent was going to be right. uh, that week. So he was able to install two weeks of spring practice <laughs> in that time frame and not having to prepare for an opponent. So you saw le them jump leaps and bounds in their improvement and uh, seeing the daily improvement right now from some of our student athletes is, is really something fun to watch and special to watch. And to see them just buy in and the care they have for each other and the energy level out of practice and off the field uh, to see the energy level they're attacking their, their classwork. And it's really something fun to see right now, the culture of the program building. Awesome. Well, we appreciate your time and uh, look forward to talking to you down the road, uh, get some updates as, as things progress and uh, good luck with everything. I know it's been a busy seven months and it's not going to slow yeah. down anytime soon, but uh it it's not <laughs> <laughs> best of luck with everything. And uh, thanks again for taking your time. All right. I appreciate it. I appreciate all you guys do for us and I'm uh, available anytime and uh, just stop by the office. I look forward to talking to you again real soon and, and appreciate what y'all do and, the, and how you do it the right way. And, and that's something to be said. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.